Boris Johnson counting his final days as British Prime Minister in disgrace but still in office till his replacement's chosen. Why did the Conservative Party accept all the lying and the U-turns for so long? My guest this week in London is Sir Malcolm Rifkin, veteran Conservative politician who served as both Defence and Foreign Secretary. No fan of Boris the politician. I never thought he should have been Prime Minister in the first place. He was the wrong person here. So what happens now to all the former ministers and officials who indulge Johnson's boosterism and falsehoods? Will the Tory party clean them out? How much did Conservatives really do to help Ukraine prepare for war? And when all said and done, will the next British Prime Minister just be more of the same? Key questions this week on Conflict Zone. Sir Malcolm Rifkin, welcome to Conflict Zone. Thank you. You wrote the other day that Boris Johnson trashed or tried to trash many of the conventions that protect British liberties and the country's unwritten constitution. And that's a very serious charge. If it's true, why do you think it took your party so long to get rid of him? Well, I think, first of all, uh, I'm not suggesting he thought of it as trashing all the conventions. Uh, the problem with Boris Johnson is he doesn't think through the implications of what he does and sometimes the seriousness of what he does. I don't think he's immoral. I think he's amoral. You're letting him off the hook here. I'm not letting him off the hook. I'm simply saying he acted in an incredibly reckless way because Britain, unlike virtually every other country in the world, does not have a written constitution. For our system to work, it relies on what you have just described as the conventions, whereby uh, Parliament and ministers uh, accept their responsibilities and desist from certain kinds of activity. And he, he seemed to believe that in his own case, because he had such a large majority in Parliament, he could get away with that, and he found he couldn't. And, and the party let him get away with it, because the writing had been on the wall for some time, hadn't it? Two ethics advisers resigning, one saying the Prime Minister put him in an odious position. The resignation in June of John Penrose, the government's own anti-corruption czar, saying Johnson had committed a fundamental breach of the ministerial code over party gate. At all these junctures, the Conservative Party looked away. Why? Okay, Why? let me. Be, I'm going to answer your question, but I have to proceed by saying uh, that in my own case, I never thought he should have been Prime Minister in the first place. He was the wrong person here. I'd, I'd love to have him at a dinner party. I did not think his remarkable qualities were suited to being Prime Minister of any country, certainly not the United Kingdom, and so did a large minority of Conservatives. But to come to your question, uh, you have you, what, one thing you didn't mention was you know, it is a very short time since he uh, led the Conservative Party to a huge majority, far greater than anyone expected. It's two and a half well, years. Let, 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 yes, precisely. But when you, were, when you have such a mandate, and, and no one, even I, suggest we would have had that large majority without his leadership at that time. He caught the public mood. He won large numbers of seats in what are called the, the Red Wall area, the, the northern parts of England, which have voted Labour for 70 years and suddenly significant numbers voted Conservative, and Conservative MPs were returned. So just because he was a vote winner, you could look away from no, all the no, transgressions no, 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 and no, all no, the I'm, trashing of no, rights? No, and no, what that. I'm saying is, it was inevitably going to be a gradual disillusionment on the part of those who had thought he was a great guy and would make a great Prime Minister, uh, but there was a consciousness that uh, removing a Prime Minister from office, uh, not at a general election, uh, but by his own party, uh, the last well, the last time that happened was Theresa May, and the time before that was Margaret Thatcher. So the Conservative Party does have a tradition, uh, unlike the Labour Party or other parties in Britain, uh, of uh, if it comes to a judgment that a prime minister has become a permanent liability rather than an asset, it can get rid of that leader very ruthlessly, as it did on this occasion. Well, you say very ruthlessly. I, I would say well, that they, 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 they took their time over this. Perhaps the most damning comment came last November from Lord Evans, chairman of the Committee yes. on Standards in Public Life, yes. about Johnson's attempt to change the disciplinary procedure for MPs while one of his own was under investigation. Evan, Evans called it a very damaging moment for Parliament and for public standards, and he gave this unprecedented warning. He said there was a danger that Britain could slip into being a corrupt country. Again, the Conservative Party looked away. Seriously, the, no, Tor well, the Tories' blind eye has been staggering, hasn't well, it? Well, you, you can put, you're perfectly entitled to put it in those terms, but you're using nice, colourful, theatrical language uh, to mask the fact 
that in a democracy, an elected prime minister uh, who has had the confidence, not just of parliament as, as a whole, but of his party, it is quite an awkward thing, to put it mildly, to suddenly dump him in the, uh, in the middle of a, a parliament. And uh, that was a gradual process because his colleagues in cabinet, and it was only the cabinet ultimately who had that power to remove him, uh, obviously were reluctant to act in such a unilateral way. And it would have been surprising if they weren't. So I, I'm not saying I wouldn't have preferred it if they'd done what they eventually did six months earlier or a year earlier. Uh, I personally would have preferred that. But then I've already told you I'd have preferred him never having been in Downing Street in the first place. Isn't the real problem with the Conservative Party that it has for too long put its own electoral fortunes above the interests of the British people. It allowed a Prime Minister to continue doing harm and lying, engaging in what the eminent historian Peter Hennessy called a bonfire of the decencies. Shouldn't the party be hanging its head in shame? that it did this? Well, again, you're using marvellous colourful language. And you know, if I was sitting where well, you're Peter sitting... Well, Peter Hennessy's uh, yeah, I know. language I said, I, is, is I've just said, if pretty I was, much on the button, I was about it? to say, if I was sitting where you're sitting, I'm sure I'd be using the same colourful language. But it actually uh, conceals as well as illustrates the nature of democratic politics. Uh, when you have a leader, whether he's a good one or a bad one, in this case a bad one, when he's been uh, elected by the proper democratic processes of the Conservative Party and then given the thumping mandate by the electorate, you know, the deposition of Margaret Thatcher in totally different circumstances. Her integrity wasn't at question in her case, um, but she was deposed by her colleagues. And not just the, uh, the party, but the country as a whole was deeply divided about that. It did quite a lot, a lot it had to happen. I was in the, the cabinet that helped deliver that at that time. Uh, so I don't regret what we did, uh, but I'm also conscious of the fact you create a trauma which can last and can create other problems by uh, if there are still large numbers of people who believe that an unfair thing has happened. So you, you can't rush to such a judgment. It can only happen gradually. And it's, and, but do remember, compare Johnson with Trump. Trump lost a, a national election, refused to go and organized or was involved in a, a, a riot at the Capitol. Johnson, with all his terrible faults, which I'm not personally intending to try and conceal, at the end of the day, he went quietly. There were no riots. There was no people marching on the House of Commons to protect him. He simply overnight said, OK, I'm issuing a statement saying I'm stepping down. If, now, that's how the system ought to work, and it did work. If he leaves office tainted, then well, the, pa the, party, the party is tainted as well. Claire Foges, former Downing Street advisor, wrote in May, the party, Conservative Party, is a wrecking ball. It smashes through parliamentary standards and public trust. It hurtles through all niceties about the truth actually mattering. It crashed through our relationship yeah. with Europe. She has a point. Johnson still insists that he can leave with his head held high. Well, of he course can't, he, can he? No, of course he can't. Truth yeah. is, he leaves in utter disgrace, but the yes. party shares some of that well, disgrace, you know, doesn't it? Well, hold on. I mean, you, again, you're using wonderful, colourful language and you're using uh, um, unqualified uh, superlatives. Uh, what uh, is also true, I, you could have added to your list of the Conservative Party, is that it has enjoyed the, conference of the uh, confidence of the British electorate for 32 of the last 50 years. Yes, but it doesn't it, now. It, is, it, it doesn't it, now. Well, at this precise moment, I'm not so sure. I think it possibly doesn't, but the Labour Party, which is the only credible alternative government, uh, doesn't inspire that confidence either. Uh, we're going through such a period. Where, what Britain is very fortunate, actually, is what we don't have is some ultra right-wing or left-wing party waiting in the, in, in the eaves to take over. We don't have a Marie Le Pen, and we don't have uh, either fascist or ultra-socialist uh, sort of alternatives. So you have a Conservative and a Labour Party as the two alternative governments. Uh, at this moment in time, I, Keir Starmer is doing his best. Let me try and be objective. He's a huge improvement on, on Corbyn, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, who almost destroyed the Labour Party. But so far as we can tell, uh, the Labour Party is not uh, at the moment capable of winning an election by itself and forming a government. So. Who knows what would happen? It, we're in the process of choosing a new prime minister. I want, I want to come on to that. So uh, that's going to be a, 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 a very later. major consideration. Yes, I want to come on to that. But, but what should happen to all those who 
lied on Johnson's behalf, the enablers who indulged him, and some who still do, those who defended him every time a new scandal broke, went to the TV studios, toured them, um, giving out the latest version of events, only to watch it crumble and uh, disappear uh, a, a, a few lot, hours or a few uh, days uh, sure, later. Sure. What should happen to these well, people? Uh, because they indulged him, didn't they? Well, They're allow, part of uh, allow me people to, who kept uh, him in power. Allow me to say there is no government in the world, democratic or authoritarian, where the members of the cabinet uh, accept that the prime minister or the president, whoever it may be, uh, it deserves a presumption that he's telling the truth <laughs> when he says that some accusation has been levelled against but Johnson him. Johnson had long true. since trashed that presumption no, 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 hold on, on so no, many no. occasions. No, because somebody has lied quite often doesn't mean everything they say must be a lie. No, but you can't give him the benefit of the doubt, well, can you? Well, you can't give him the benefit. But Not you, if he's an habitual liar, can you? Well... It depends on the issue. It depends on the other evidence. That You're being is... very kind. No, I'm not being party. kind. I'm trying to be rational. And you are for once being very irrational, <laughs> as you perfectly well know. <laughs> what I am saying is that a government, the government of the country, the Queen's government has to go on. You don't just sack prime ministers as if it's, a, particularly those who have just a couple of years ago won a huge majority from the electorate in a fr genuine free election. It's a serious matter. And the government, whoever is the government, I uh, was in Margaret Thatcher's government for the, the full period of her term. And some of the time I disagreed strongly with what she was doing. Uh, if, if you feel strongly on a particular matter for which you have the departmental responsibility, then you resign. But all the time when the cabinet reaches a decision, that decision will be presented as a unanimous decision of the cabinet because those who were in a minority are willing to go along with it. So you're telling me that... That's the, what happens in any democratic country at any time, and it couldn't happen otherwise, but otherwise but governments would be collapsing every six months. But you're telling me now that there's no need for a clean-out of never all the that. old officials. Is there a need I, for a clean-out of the party officials well, and, I, and I, Johnson's I, acolytes well, in order to restore public well, you, trust? You're, you're using nice neutral phrases like Johnson's acolytes. Uh, there are some members of his team uh, uh, who are not my uh, flavour of the month, as it were, who I hope will, whose services I hope will not be required uh, by the new Prime Minister. And I'm not going to name names in this particular interview because that's not my function. I'm a private citizen and I don't see the need to. Um, but of course I hope the new Prime Minister, whoever he or she might be, uh, will use the opportunity. And actually the, the most important thing I, I think the new Prime Minister should do is uh, create a cabinet of all the talents. Because Johnson didn't do that. Uh, Johnson surrounded himself uh, some people he'd surrounded himself with were of cabinet stature. Uh, some, frankly, should never have been in the cabinet in the first place. So, Malcolm, there's a lot of talk about restoring trust and integrity in government, but already some in your party are writing almost Pravda style, the alternative history of the Johnson era. The pretense is that he got all the big calls right, but he patently didn't, did he? Uh, of course, I, you're asking me to say what I've already said in public many, many times. Of course, he got a lot of the decisions, in my view, badly wrong. Some are right. Uh, actually, to be fair to him, on Ukraine, he has provided a degree of uh, leadership uh, of a very impressive kind that took me by surprise. Uh, and uh, he's been, uh, apart from the United States, uh, the leading champion of Ukraine and perceived by the Ukrainians themselves as one of their closest friends. But that version is slightly misleading, isn't it? The truth is that for seven years following Russia's invasion of Crimea, Britain refused to send weapons that Kiev needed despite the fact that they were asking for them on a regular basis. Why, why isn't sorry, that acknowledged? So, sorry, if you wish to move on from what you were previously asking, please acknowledge that's what you're doing. You can't blame Johnson for what happened in the last seven years. Well, for the time that he was Foreign Secretary. Well, but he wasn't Prime Minister and he didn't control the government. And I don't know what internal discussions took place then. I know, for example, because it's become public, that Ben Wallace as Defence Secretary was arguing at an earlier time for more practical help, military help, to be given to the Ukrainians. But that wasn't happening either in Britain or the United States or in other Western countries. This is just what a British phenomenon. What is true, uh, and it should be acknowledged, is that before the invasion of Crimea, the only two Western countries that were giving serious military help to Ukraine were the United States and the United Kingdom. And they were doing so uh, by, for example, military training, Openly, it wasn't secret. Some of it might have been secret. Uh, some of it was quite open that British military personnel were training. How do you think Ukraine was able in six years, six years ago at the time of Crimea's annexation, Ukraine's army was about 10,000 strong. When Putin invaded, it was 120,000 strong. So they not only had to build up an army, 
but it was trained in different concepts of warfare to what the old Soviet Union used to do and what Russia still does, which is why in the first few weeks of the invasion of Ukraine, the Ukrainians were able to hold on to Kiev and Putin was humiliated. Now that was because British and American military personnel had been actively involved in giving advice, they could only give advice, not instructions, to the Ukrainian military uh, before the invasion uh, as to how they should operate. And the second point, if I may, is on cyber. We all assumed that if there was going to be a Russian attack on Ukraine, the first thing they would do in 24 hours would have been to completely neutralize the whole infrastructure in Ukraine through hacking and cyber attacks. They weren't able to do that. Why? Because we now know that GCHQ, Britain's uh, special uh, intelligence agency that deals with these matters, uh, was authorized by the British government to give lots of advice to the Ukrainians over the last few years, as was happening from others as well, on how to deal with uh, cyber attacks and protect your infrastructure. You talk about what was done before Putin actually decided to invade. To invade, yes, invade. That's exactly but, it, but it wasn't until June last year that the government agreed to help Ukraine rebuild its navy. Yes. But by then it was too late. The ships weren't ready for the invasion. Ukraine's ambassador, Vadim Pristeko, said, we had to scrap the project. It was just delay after delay. Doesn't that sadden you? No, well, in my own personal case, I would have liked more practical help to be given earlier. That was always, that's my public view and so I'm not going to pretend otherwise. But, you know, it's a pretty controversial question because uh, Ukraine is not a member of NATO uh, and therefore the provision of military assistance to a country that might be involved in a war in the short to medium term is a very complex question, not just for the United States. But they were involved in a war in the east of the country, well, no, that, fueled by Russia, uh, weren't they? Uh, yes, of, co of course. They have been they fighting had, they since had been. 2014. Yes, but that had become a frozen conflict and I was talking about a new war of the kind that we now have, have experienced. So for, uh, the United States and the United Kingdom might have responded to Ukraine's needs slower uh, than the Ukrainians would have liked, but they responded at Amsai quicker than France or Germany or any other NATO country or any other country in the world. And the Ukrainians have acknowledged that. Let's talk, if we may, about Boris Johnson's unusual relations, let's put it that way, with, with Russia and Russians. In, in 2018, a month after the Russians used Novichok to try and kill Sergei Skripal and his yes. daughter in Salisbury, Johnson flew to Italy, minus his security detail and his officials, and attended a party at which he met a former KGB oligarch, Alexander Lebedev. No details of those discussions were ever made public, and it took four years for the Prime Minister to act, actually confirm that the meeting had taken place. Is that lack of accountability acceptable for no, the British not. Foreign Secretary? No. no, you, no what do you read into that then? Well, <laughs> nothing that I didn't already know, uh, that Johnson ha has a long history of being reckless, uh, of doing things without accepting the implications of them. And of course, as Foreign Secretary, if he was going abroad and meeting people of that kind, the Foreign Office should have been aware of that for his own protection, apart from any other reasons. So these are all reasons why uh, quite a number of us uh, never thought he was suitable to be prime minister in the first place. Uh, sadly, that was not the view uh, of the majority of parliamentarians uh, or of the public who gave him power at the last general election. Was he soft on Russia, in your opinion? Two, yeah. two parliamentary inquiries in 2018 and 2020, when he was prime minister, called for sanctions to be imposed on Russian oligarchs. They were largely ignored. Uh, I wasn't involved in government, so I don't know the details of what went on at that time. Um, so I'm not going to offer a judgment on, on why that was not done, because I simply don't know. Is one of the reasons that he may have gone soft on Russia the fact that so much Russian money was pouring into the, the no, Tory party no. coffers at the time? No, insofar as the... They did get a lot of Russian money. Well, well, you talk of Russian money as if it's coming from the Kremlin, and you know perfectly well it isn't. Uh, well, you so, know perfectly well, it's very difficult no, no, hold to, on, just to hold say on. where it's no, coming no, no. from. Look, first of all, I'm not going to go into the detail of this, partly because I don't know the detail, and partly because I think you're on pretty tricky ground here. First of all, the law is you can only accept in political donations from British citizens. Now, there happen to be a number of people, not just Russians, but of other nationalities, who have acquired British citizenship, who are living law-abiding, so far as we know, lives in the United Kingdom and some of whom have donated to the Conservative Party. You cannot describe that as Russian money, which to your viewers will sound as if it's uh, Putin uh, bribing a uh, British, uh, British political party. That's complete rubbish, and I, you know perfectly well it is. 
you were chair of the Intelligence and Security Committee 2010 to yes. 2015, which gets to ask questions that the public don't get to and ask. And to get it, answers. And to get answers that the public doesn't <laughs> hear either. Um, Johnson refused multiple efforts by MPs to investigate whether Russia had interfered with the Brexit referendum. The government said a retrospective assessment of the EU referendum is not necessary. How could Johnson have known that when he didn't even ask the security well, services to find out? Sure. I, well, I make an additional point to what you just said. The Intelligence and Security Committee can, is free to investigate any subject it wishes. It does not need the Prime Minister's permission to do so. And it that, needs his permission to publish its report, uh, well, that's which a, was long no, delayed by Johnson. Yes, that's a separate point. But the actual report itself uh, and, and the investigation, if, the, if it was felt by the, the all-party Intelligence and Security Committee, I chaired it for five years and we gave it additional new powers. Parliament gave it the sort of powers it needed so that it was not dependent on the Prime Minister of the day as to whether it could make investigations of this kind. So uh, the presumption of your question is just not valid. Let's look at the contest to replace mm. Boris Johnson at the moment. Three candidates left as we speak. Yes. I know that later on today there's going to be just two. All of them were Johnson appointees. Whoever wins, will it just be more of the same? Well, I, I hope not. Uh, and I have no reason to believe it because they are, are very different. I, I don't mean they're very different from each other. Uh, all three of them are very different from Johnson. Uh, Sunak, uh, Mordaunt, uh, Truss. Uh, there has no, that I'm aware of, been any uh, type of public criticism remotely of a kind that uh, correctly addressed itself to Boris Johnson. Uh, and uh, the, over the last couple of weeks, if there was anything n new to discover about them, uh, then that, I suspect, would have been on the headlines of every newspaper in Britain. But there was nothing there was. So we must assume uh, that they, they have, a, all three of them have a history of public service, of integrity, uh, and uh, I'm more in favour of some than others, but that's, an, that's, a, that's a question of personal preference. But their integrity has not been a major issue that I'm aware of. The two debates so far have revealed very little apart from huge animosity between the various candidates, so much so that the contestants pulled out of the third debate, although there will be one between the, the, the final two. Um, this is a party very much at war with itself, isn't it? No, it's, when, when, it's whenever, a divided party, isn't no, come it? Come on, come on. Seriously divided no, no, party. No. Whenever you have in any democratic party uh, an open competition uh, to choose a new leader who, if you're in government, will become the prime minister or president, depending on which country we're talking about. Of course, that, that, that's a democracy, actually. You know, if, if they pretended they agreed with each other all the time, you'd be saying to me, well, they just seem a bunch of clones. There's nothing to, you can't tell one from the other, all saying exactly the same thing. Well, that, that would be your criticism. And such. Now, yeah. what, what we are seeing is a democracy at work. And of course, within a major political party, uh, like the, not just the Conservative Party, same applies to the Labour Party or any other major party, uh, you, you have a broad church. You know, I was not a Thatcherite when I was in uh, Mrs. Thatcher's cabinet. Uh, there were a number of things I disagreed with. That's normal. And you, you try not to wash your dirty linen in public, as it were. But in the, if you're actually standing for office, the public are entitled to know what are not just things you share in common with your colleagues, but what are the differences? You, you'd include the European Research Group in the, in the um, um, broad church description? Well, of course they are. They are all conservatives. They take the conservative And, the, and, they're, and they're Brexit orthodoxy that nobody's allowed to challenge without being well, set on? Well, you say nobody's allowed to challenge without being set on. They're perfect, as entitled as you or I am to criticise people they disagree with. Well, they get and shouted do so down, publicly. don't they? The big well, lie is that Brexit is marvellous. No, no, hold on. The, I, I'm Isn't got, it? I am not a supporter of the European Research Group, because uh, the people you're referring to, but they have exactly the same political right as any other political animal, any other member of parliament, any other member of the public, dare I say it, even any other journalist, uh, to condemn views they disapprove of uh, and to criticise people who are arguing for things they think would be against the national interest. What's wrong with that for crying out loud? This, that's what democracy is about. Has nobody ever told you that? What's the future for this party? Democratic? Democratic or divided into wings, you know, um, hard right pushing Brexit, um, earning, let, let, getting let, rid of all the criticism out there. Let me Can you think of one thing about Brexit that has worked well? Well, well I, I was a Remainer, so you, I know, uh, but uh, I'm asking you: Can you think of one thing about Brexit yes. that has worked well? Yeah, what? Yeah, yeah yes. What? The, the country's calmed down. 
Really? The, yes. I'll tell you what exactly. The country isn't working. I'm talking about, we're talking about Brexit, I think. Yes. Right. Yes. Now, what I'm saying to you, I don't think you would challenge, certainly not privately, you might choose to for the purpose of this interview, uh, is that for a number of years, for about 10 years, Britain was deeply divided, including the referendum itself, on whether, and families were divided and communities were divided. And there was a lot of uh, aggro about that. It's still and, and, divided. Well, let me it's finish my divided. answer. And it was dominating the British political scene uh, to the expense of almost anything else. Now, it, if it could be resolved, it had to be resolved. And if it was resolved by a large majority, or whatever majority it was, saying we were going to stay in, then hopefully it would have calmed down as well. But the important thing is that the issue has gone off the boil. Mr. Farage, God bless him, has disappeared. Nobody is remotely interested in him or his party because the issue itself is not dominating British politics. Okay. So Malcolm Rifkin, we have to disappear, unfortunately. <laughs> thanks, thanks very much indeed for being on conference. Thank you very much. Thank you.